Bingo, we're back. We're back with research in Manoa. We are so excited to do this show. The show comes to us from the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, which is part of SOAS, the School of Ocean, Earth, and Science. Ocean, Earth. Ocean and Earth, Science, and Science Technology. Science and technology <laughs> at UH Manoa. And we're so happy today to have uh, Chris Deere. And uh, I can't pronounce his, uh, his actual born name. It's Shimislav. Very close. Cool. Shimislav, yeah. Uh, but known as Chris Deere. He's a researcher at HIGP. Uh, in the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology. And um, we have Hannah Shelton. She's an undergraduate alumnus of the University of Hawaii and currently uh, a third year PhD student in mineral physics. And I guess that means uh, material science, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having okay. us. So Thank tell you. us what you guys do, because they need to know what you do at UH Manoa in your laboratory. Um, we are a, a group that specializes in uh, high pressure and high temperature experiments. Uh, what we do has applications to uh, earth science, material science, chemistry, physics. So it's multidisciplinary. We basically try to learn about how matter behaves when it's taken to extremes, extreme cold, extreme hot, extreme compression, bottoms of the ocean, centers of the planets. Um, we look at how new substances can be formed that you don't find normally on the Earth, how they can be used for their unique properties. Uh, what happens with rocks when you squeeze them uh, particularly hard? Yeah. Oh, that's just a short, uh, a short description of much more. Can you can you show the um, uh, the atomic structure that you have down on the floor, <laughs> okay. and so people get an idea of what we're talking about? What is that now? Uh, this is a model of. Uh, uh, Enstatite, a, a silicate crystal that is present in a lot of uh, uh, rocks uh, that build up the earth mantle. Um, and it's one of the objects of our investigation. What we do in the lab is we take a, a real crystal, not this model, we squeeze it to uh, very high pressures and temperatures, and we try to use methods based on mostly on scattering of x-rays to see what happens with these individual atoms and bonds, whether they do something interesting, whether uh, the properties change, conductivity, um, color, uh, density. Um, and we try to put this in a context of what it means for the Earth, yeah. whether that means some rocks sinking in lava or, or floating yeah. or, or earthquakes forming. But it could mean much more than that. Let me, let me just articulate some of the stuff I learned from you before the show began. Number one is um, you can look at existing um, organic and inorganic uh, atoms and compounds. Uh, two is uh, you can test them and put them under those stress situations and, and see what their characteristics are, not only naturally, but when you stress them. And three is you can build them. Uh, if you like what you see, if you like the properties and characteristics or the way they react, this is almost like GMO. <laughs> you, know, you can change the way the physical sure. world works. This is really amazing. So in the process of learning about these, these atoms and these atomic structures, and um, you can find new things that we never had before and find new things that will do new, th new, new functionality in our world. Um, uh, you can make Bill Gates look like a piker. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll talk about that right after this movie because we have a movie which uh, you, will explain at least some of what you do, okay? Let's run the movie. <laughs>
Edward Munch, one of my favorite. <laughs> That's a fabulous painting he did. <laughs> yep. It's wonderful. Uh, portrayed so much. So, um, you know, I get, the, I get the sense of it that we're here in Hawaii, nay, you know, 2,500 miles from anything, and yet you're at the frontier. This is global science you're doing. Yes. I think it's, yeah, it's pretty progressive, but it requires some instrumentation. What, what we do is basically lab-based science. So we, do, we use devices, we need instruments to make observations. So the two solutions we have for this right now is, uh, one is uh, long-range traveling. <laughs> so we go to Chicago to this beautiful facility you could see in the movie Argon National Lab. And we have our own instrument over there that we can use, our students can use for uh, mm. their research. You've been there, Hannah? I have, many mm. times. I kind of knew that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's actually quite difficult at, at first in graduate school because there's a lot of classes they have to take, there's lab work they have to do on campus, and there's travel, which is, means working overnight and so on. So I, I think Hannah can share some of her experiences. And yeah. But first, tell me what kind of equipment you have in your laboratory here. What's it like? How are you outfitted? And um, um, where can I get this? Because this has got to be very extraordinary equipment. Yeah. So I, I started at the University of Hawaii about three years ago. Um, when we started, we didn't really have much in the lab other than microscopes, so you could make quantitative uh, visual observations, but you couldn't really measure something uh, exactly. But with, with time, we kind of built it up, and we just uh, outfitted a brand new lab with a, a big grant we received from National Science Foundation. So we have some, some video footage of this lab. This is the lab that Hannah and other students use in their research. We use it uh, to teach students in undergraduate classes about methods for characterizing minerals that they uh, Receive, well, look at that one now. Sure. Okay, yeah. we have a second movie to show you the equipment, and uh, we'll describe it as we go through the movie. So the lab is called an X-ray Atlas lab. Uh, Atlas refers to uh, something that is able to hold very big weight, <laughs> and X-ray means that that's the method that we use. Uh, we have twin instruments. This is a pretty unique system. Uh, one of the of these instruments is for measuring uh, powdered samples. The other one is for measuring single crystal, small pieces of rocks. Um, it's a lab that was just recently renovated. Uh, we use optical microscopes to uh, mount the samples. Um, we have a video observation system on the instrument which allows to uh, align it with the X-ray beam. Um, this is one of the newest instruments in the world. Uh, the company that makes this uh, instrument, uh, Brooker, is based in Wisconsin just came up with uh, some uh, very significant upgrades of components. So I think this was the first one with this particular configuration they sold uh, worldwide. So you can see on the right side, on the left side, uh, a crystal, uh, a small crumb of a crystal about uh, human hair size. On the right side, you can see a scattering pattern of x-rays that uh, shines uh, towards the detector. This is uh, another graduate student uh, grinding a, a rock sample for analysis. So if you find uh, a piece of rock in the field, you can bring it to our lab, grind it like this, and, and uh, uh, the instrument will tell you what kind of minerals are present in what proportions. And you can also use it for this uh, uh, materials uh, research, uh, like uh, what we talk about, uh, looking for super hard materials or looking for transformations materials undergo under pressure and temperature. So this is a great educational resource. Uh, we have a lot of students interested in using it either for thesis research or just uh, for part of their uh, class lab sections. Mm -hmm. But it's also a very advanced uh, uh, research instrument. So it, it gives us an edge in being able to do experiments other people cannot do in their labs because they lack this kind of uh, infrastructure. So this, this is now he's doing, um, this is done with light? What is this exact machine doing? X-ray light. So the, there's a source that emits X-rays, like the ones that are used in dental analysis. Mm -hmm. X-rays are shined on the sample, and the sample scatters them. Depending on the nature of the sample, you analyze the interference pattern, the pattern that the sample emits. And from this, you can calculate uh, a model where the atoms are and how they are connected. OK. Um, before we go to our break, uh, I, want, I do want to hear from Hannah about how she got involved in this and uh, what, what she's doing and, um, um, you know, whether it's a career. So I started out at the UH Manila in the chemistry department and uh, originally I did not expect to end up in the geology and geophysics department at all. Um, what happened was, at least for me, is I got 
kind of a typical undergraduate uh, lab job within the within SOAS for a couple different labs, and I was just immensely impressed by the type of work they were doing. Uh, the people there are amazing, and when I was ready to graduate, I you know was highly encouraged by uh, one of my bosses at the time to apply and. When I applied, that, that means a lot when that happens. Yes, yeah. So I, I gave it a shot, and then um, Chamek was able. You know, saw my application, uh, was you know, I guess appreciated my chemistry background. I would I would hope, and then I was able to come on. And part of the big selling point was the the collaborative aspect that we have with the Advanced Photon Source in Chicago. Um, that's uh, something that even in your average graduate career, having access to national lab facilities is, uh, it's, it's a very special thing. It's yeah. very, very, it's a high privilege indeed. Yeah, yeah. So where, you're, you're uh, on your way to a, a PhD here? Yes. What's your PhD subject? So as part of the high pressure mineral physics group, I do this kind of work that we've been talking about. It's this kind of this intersection between geology and material science at these extreme conditions. Now, over, uh, in terms of what the piece of paper will say, it will be part of the geology and geophysics department. But mm -hmm. at the graduate level, uh, particularly within SOAS, it's maybe 50-50 between people who have a traditional geology background and those coming from outside di disciplines like chemistry, like physics, uh, mathematics, stuff like that. Wow, it all comes together, doesn't it? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. We, we we have a couple of minutes to describe what's on the table. Uh, so, Chris, maybe you go, Hannah, whenever, whoever's running this equipment, tell me yeah, what's on the table. Know, sure. that about. Sure. So, what I have in front of me is a mock-up of uh, one of the experimental techniques that we use, and this is called a diamond anvil cell. And in essence, what we're doing with this cell is that we have two halves, and in the middle is a diamond. These are not real diamonds, this is all plastic. Yeah, this right? is only yeah. the one you gave me so I could take it home to my wife? This yeah, is not a real diamond? Then? Unfortunately, it is not. We wish okay. it was too, oh, but... I'm disappointed. But what happens is that in actuality, we take these gem quality diamonds and the tip of the diamond, the kind that would sit kind of at the, bo at the base of the ring, if you had one, yeah. um, we shave it off to make a flat surface that we call a culet. And what we do then is that under the microscope, we put our sample, usually a single crystal of something that we want to look at, on the tip of the diamond and then close the cell kind of like a sandwich. So we have the diamonds compressing. And this diamond is the hardest substance in the world. Yes. So why we use diamonds is that, one, it's for the hardness. They're not the only anvils that exist. There are other materials, but they're very, very desirable because of their hardness, but also because they're transparent. So if we wanted to look down in the microscope through our anvil... At the moment of compression. Yes, yeah, so we have... see the physical process of compression. Yes, so we have a that. visual feed continually while we're doing our experiment. And that goes back to sometimes when we compress our materials, we see color changes, we see wow. uh, physical phenomena that's just apparent to the so naked eye. So you're recording this. Yes. Oh, wow, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. So I like that, that footage, too. I, I think you, you caught the essence of, of uh, advantage of this technique very well. So you said that this is while this is happening. We, we call this in situ, as opposed to ex situ, which is you cook and then look what happened. Yeah, yeah. So what, one of the first fields where uh, high pressure technologies were industrially explored was uh, synthesis of diamond for uh, abrasives applications, for jewelry applications, and so on. This was done in the 1950s by General Electric. And th the only method that they had to do it at that time was the cook and look method. So they used large hydraulic presses that could compress large quantities of samples, but you couldn't see what is happening with the sample while you are doing it, and an experiment would take a day or longer. So it's a very slow process. With a device like this, because you can see us, the process is happening, it's much faster and gives you an answer right away. Yeah. Well, I'll give you a break right away. <laughs> Wonderful. We can do Aloha. I'm Carl Campagna, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. I hope you join us over the next several weeks as we take a deep dive into biofuels in Hawaii and explore the alternative fuels supply chain necessary for the local and global transition towards transportation fuel sustainability. 
Join us as we have good conversations with our farmers, our producers, our conversion technologies, our investors, and our legislators as we try to achieve our transportation sustainability goals. See you soon. You're watching SyncTech Hawaii on SyncTechHawaii.com, which broadcasts six live talk shows from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then streams earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from SyncTech. Bingo, we're back. Um, we're back with Chris Dara and Hannah Shelton, and they both work in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology uh, with materials science, and um, very interesting work they do. And this is, an, uh, this is a mock-up of an actual yes. compression press. Yes. How big is the compress, the real one? So the real one is actually much smaller, and I have it in my hands right here. You can kind of see for scale. The mock-up, the black mock-up is gosh, that would be six or seven times the scale. Yeah, so. so all of the work that we do in this one, you might be able to see the diamonds shining, is all under the microscope. So this can't really be done with the naked eye. So the microscope is going to look through the aperture, Yes. Uh, through the diamond that you're using to, to compress. And I mean, how do you get those things to compress? You have to have a, another device like... So. The really good thing about the diamond anvil cell is that functionally it's a very simple device. So once we put the two halves of our cell together, mm -hmm. uh, we're able just to compress it together with screws that act as a vise. So there'll be screw holes that feed between the two halves of the cell. And because, in essence, force is just, uh, um, excuse me, it, it's just exerted over a certain amount of area, the smaller amount There's of... There's a formula, isn't there? There is, yeah. Um, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, bug in my throat. When, uh, when we apply a lot of force, uh, pressure is just force over an area. There we go. When we apply a lot of force over a very tiny amount of area, we can get a lot of pressure. So we exert pressures. Uh, so it doesn't need a big it, you don't, fill the room gizmo exactly. to do with your hands. We do it with our hands, <laughs> just with a, a pair of hex wrenches, basically. So like we were talking about earlier with General Electric's uh, forays into doing this high pressure machine, uh, high pressure uh, synthesis, high pressure science, they needed um, very large volume presses these hydraulic presses, and they still exist, but this allows us this to... This is a lot more efficient. This is more efficient. Work, yeah. Sometimes we have samples that are uh, hard to get, so you can't get a lot of them, and that lends itself Just well to careful. this as well. Yeah. So if I, if I turn the hex net on it, hex nut on yep. it, uh, there's several of them. I'm going to turn it a mm -hmm. little bit. Yeah. So are you measuring exactly how much you're turning it? Is it calibrated so you're turning it just a little bit, and you, you watch then through the through the diamond to see how much that little bit of compression is going to change things? So there's several ways that we can do this. Kind of the old-fashioned way is just doing this by hand and then checking periodically what the pressure is. Typically we have a calibrant inside the cell with our sample and that when we look at the calibrant... What was the calibrant? So oftentimes we use a piece of ruby, so a piece of corundum, but there's other ones we can use as well. But for us, uh, the way ruby behaves with pressure is very reliable. It's been studied extensively. So, so what property of ruby do we use to measure pressure? So it, in this case, it's the fluorescence of the ruby. So we shine a green laser on it, and the spectra that it gives back to us when we look at it, uh, depending how that spectra shifts, we can tell exactly what pressure uh, is within the cell. And this works especially well at very, very high pressures that we're looking at. Interesting. The pressure translates to change yes. in color. That's quite amazing. Yes. Of light. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, um, okay, so th uh, this is central in your research, this whole yes. process uh, with the diamond and the press and the compression to see what happens. What, what kinds of things do you learn as you turn the, st turn the screws? Yep. We should have called, we, we actually, you know, the, 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 the title of this show is Modern Alchemy from Hades to Heaven uh, with Mineral Physics. But we should have said something about turning the screws 
on modern alchemy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about that, but it's a good angle. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the reference I was trying to use in the, uh, in the title was basically supposed to uh, reflect the multidisciplinary applications of what we do. So Hades uh, is a representation of something down below, so the earth interior in this, in this case. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hades is supposed to be very hot, so what we often do is we heat our samples while they are squeezed. Um, heat and pressure uh, help to carry forward the chemical processes, so if you are after making a new material, um, and an example here is trying to make uh, materials harder or di than diamond or, or similarly hard to diamond but, but much less expensive. So by combining pressure and temperature, you have a good way of, uh, of uh, making new chemicals, chemicals that you wouldn't be able to, uh, to make otherwise in like wet chemistry lab. Yeah. Um, and heaven was the reference to uh, simulating extraterrestrial environments, uh, just as uh, easily as we can simulate the uh, environment that earth rocks experience in the earth interior. We can simulate what happens during meteorite impact or, or uh, at the centers oh. of other planets that can be built from different chemicals. I'm starting there. to get the idea. So a lot of minerals, anyway, down in the center of the Earth, you know, have been cooking in some way or under pressure in some Absolutely. way yes. for millennia. And um, you are able to do that. You're able to simulate that with, with your press and, I guess, with yeah. other gear. So that now you can uh, you can create a similar process and see what you can make. You can actually, like Earth made some of these materials, you can make these materials. And you can make different kinds of materials that are different than the materials that Earth made. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah, it's a yeah. very good, Isn't that scary? Very good summary. <laughs> First, I think it would be it's, it's, more I think exciting. It's but fascinating. Yeah. I've, I've always been very taken by the fact that uh, nature has figured out its own way of making most of the things that we care about, like diamonds. Diamonds are made in Earth naturally. Uh, I'm taking this yeah, home, and by It the takes way. us this big intellectual <laughs> effort to figure out how to replicate this, but Earth has its own cooking recipe for making diamonds. It's kind of the same with a lot of technologically relevant uh, materials. If you take apart your cell phone, one of the very important uh, parts of your cell phone is going to be uh, made from ferroelectric material. So an example of a family of uh, widely used ferroelectric materials are materials with structures similar to a mineral called perovskite. So perovskite is very widely is present. That, is that a, something on the periodic table? Uh, it, it's a compound. It's a, it's okay. a silicate uh, okay. mineral, right? So, so Earth found uh, its own ways at certain depths to make a lot of perovskite. Chemists kind of reproduced this recipe but use different uh, elements to enhance some properties, like, for example, the properties that, that uh, are important for frequencies that you use in, uh, in, in, in the cell phone. Yeah. Um, so, so theoretically, then, um, this is a way out. Just tell me. You could create a new kind of perovskite. You could, you could make a better, if, if you like the characteristics of perovskite, you can make a better one. And you could have better characteristics for cell phones or who knows what kind of electronics. Uh, we can, we, we're, we're into this now. This is something yes. that can happen. Yeah. Absolutely. And this actually is happening weekly. There's, this, this field is growing uh, quite rapidly because looking at varied pressure conditions is kind of like opening a new dimension. And if you're just stuck with temperature and changing your chemicals, you're more limited. If you have one more dimension to explore, one more parameter to add to this, your cooking recipes become richer. You can, you can have more variety. And it, the, the variations are not only by choosing elements, but also by changing the nature of components. So if, if we talk about these perovskite materials, uh, there's a lot of functional perovskite that are made with atoms other than the ones that are found in the Earth. But we are now into making hybrid organic inorganic perovskites. What's so, a hi I know organic and I know inorganic, but I didn't know there was a hybrid. <laughs> sure. So one of my favorite movies is uh, uh, Star Trek Voyager, okay? So okay. The, the Starship uh, Voyager had uh, um, You heard it here on Pink Tech. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Starship Voyager had an energy source which was uh, basically biologically derived, the neuro cells or something like this. It was integrated into ship based on electronics and physics. Yeah. So it's kind of the same with materials. You can take an uh, atomic arrangement like this one, yeah. uh, make some holes in it that are large enough to fit organic molecules, and then you get a hybrid material. It doesn't mean that it's alive. It yeah. means that it's made of molecules like your body and yeah. hard atoms like rocks. Yeah. But it, this 
hybrid nature can give it uh, special properties. So it doesn't mean it's alive. We're not no. tampering no. with biology here. No. It just happens to be a biological molecules, that's all. Sure. So interesting. My God, that, that mind, mind blowing, actually. <laughs> and with this, who knows what can happen? It's, it, 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 it's never found in nature. So you're creating a whole new marriage yep. of the materials around us on Earth. That is amazing. So, what are you working on right now? So, Hannah's project is kind of along these lines. Why don't you uh, <laughs> tell about your project? So, in general, my project has to do with how a lot of these minerals, these uh, rock-forming minerals, behave when we introduce water into them. And more specifically, what does the bonding, what does the hydrogen bonding introduced by that water, what does it do at the conditions within the interior of the Earth? So. We have a couple of uh, transparencies. Could we show oh, yeah, them? Let's they show them. illustrate yeah, 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 what, yeah, what yeah. Hannah is talking about? Oh, we don't have them. Oh, okay. so that's, that's fine. okay. No worries. Yeah, no worries. But fairly recently, uh, there was a discovery showing that actually in a diamond inclusion brought up one of these deep earth minerals and it was found to have a lot of water contained within it. Now this was kind of a surprise for a long time people assumed that the interior of the earth was more or less dry. There was some water brought down uh, when slabs subduct, when plate tectonics occurs, but people didn't have a very good grasp on how much water was sitting underneath us and based upon this this extracted mineral that had a lot of water bound up within it, some people estimate that there's, you know, multitudes of oceans worth of water sitting below us in the mantle. Even in hot temperature? In the hot temperature, bound up within these minerals. I see, I see. Yeah. So you can, you can have water, but it's not in liquid form. It's not in it's liquid form. It's bound up, and yep. therefore the yes. fact that everything is so hot around it, that's not going to make it boil off or anything. Yeah, so in these instances, it's chemically bound up within the minerals that we're looking at. And so a lot of our research goes into trying to experimentally recreate the conditions like we were talking about of the interior of the Earth. And that allows us to get kind of a best case scenario uh, environment for us to study the properties of these minerals. And this lets us go back and communicate with other geoscientists like seismologists, like volcanologists, and lets us communicate with what they see. So they come to us saying we saw this sort of seismic occurrence or we got this mineral out of a lava flow and it looks interesting you know, what are the environments deep below the earth where we can't really look that would have created this situation? So that's a lot of it's what we do. It's fascinating, yeah. it's fascinating. I, have you published, are you gonna publish? I have published, yeah. Oh good, yeah. Uh, in this line of research? Yes. That's yeah. fabulous. So we're, we're out of time, but uh, Chris, can you, can you face uh, that camera over there and tell the people why they should care about what you're doing, how this is gonna affect their lives, change our lives altogether in this planet? I think it will, but you tell them. Uh, I think to some extent our uh, society has uh, already explored what we had available, the classical uh, ways of uh, you know, supplying energy and, and uh, fueling our cars and so on. So I think for the long term future we really have to look at novel ways of, of solving these problems. And material science is one of the sciences that can provide these answers. And I think what we do, the extreme condition science, is one of the angles we can take at it. It's, it's a method that provides ways to synthesize uh, novel materials with unique properties that can uh, harvest light for us or store hydrogen or yeah. tell us how water behaves in the deep earth mantle. Yeah, Un unbelievable. And, and he didn't say this, but I will. It's only beginning. <laughs> yeah, of yeah. course. <laughs> okay, that's Chris Dera. Uh, Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, School of Ocean, Earth Science and Technology, and graduate student Hannah Shelton, who is an undergraduate alumnus of UH and currently in her third year PhD program in mineral uh, physics. What an exciting discussion. Thank you so much. Hannah and Chris, thank you very wonderful much. Wonderful to talk to you.